Today on Yesteryear's Mac Games, we have the fondly remembered Super Maze Wars from 1993. The premise couldn't be simpler for this one. If it moves and isn't a gem, shoot it. Memories of this game are quite prominent among people who had Macs in the mid-90s, because it came pre-installed on a lot of them back then. The Performer 5200 I used as a child was one of these, so with no TV, because I lived in a non-English speaking country back then, and a very small selection of games available, I played this one an awful lot. The game's about menu sets the scene. Inside your battle-hardened maze cruiser, you roam the mazed hallways of a foreign world, determined to claim victory over up to seven human and or robot-controlled opponents. Human-controlled opponents? That's right. This was a popular title for network play. It used Apple Talk, so if you had multiple Macs and willing participants, you could get some multiplayer going. To move through the big blue mazes, a player must use the arrow keys. Shooting the standard weapon, dubbed a blaster, is done with space, while discharging a special weapon, dubbed the butt kicker missile, is achieved with alt. It takes three blaster shots, or one butt kicker, to bring swift polygonal destruction to an opponent, and more if they've picked up a shield enhancement. You cannot, however, smash away at the spacebar willy-nilly, as your blaster shots are limited. You can have up to three blasts spiralling down a hole at any one time. The dots down the left side of the screen display how many you have left. On the right hand side is your shield. A quick tour of the rest of the in-game interface then. Near the bottom left you have three turquoise squares. These represent power-ups and will light up when you acquire one. From left to right they are blast speed up, ship speed up and cornering speed up. They're all reasonably useful, although you lose whatever you've picked up every time you're destroyed. Next to that in dark blue sits info on the game time, or how many rounds are left, depending on the win conditions. Next to that are the lights displaying how many butt kickers you have, out of a maximum of three. At the bottom right, something you absolutely don't want to see light up. If an opponent has launched a butt kicker at you, this bar will display how close it is. By the time it's fully lit, you will be hit. In the middle of this interface, you have the radar, and to the sides of that, all the players and the number of points they have scored. I find myself looking at the radar far more than the main 3D bit above, for the simple reason that it's how you locate everything, from the various colours of power-up capsules to opponents. Only about a third of the main game screen is the view from your maze cruiser. This is fairly typical of early games that did 3D. It was probably kept small to allow smoother animations on older machines. The specs for this game are minimal. These are 256 colours or greys, 2 megabytes of RAM if you're using System 6.0.7, and 4 megabytes if you're running System 7 and MultiFinder. I'm running this on a 400 megahertz G3 PowerBook running System 9, so its compatibility is pretty darn good. The 3D graphics themselves then are very rudimentary. It's just blue floors and blue walls, or grey grey and more grey if you're playing on a Mac without colour. Ship explosions are the most interesting that the game's animation gets, and I suppose the item capsules are a neat shape. The middle of them starts to disappear the longer they have been in the playing field, and will despawn if left alone too long. So what are the objectives of this game? Well, that differs depending on what game mode you've selected. There's six of them, and if I'm honest, they don't differ very much. Frenzy could be seen as the default, where a single point is scored per kill. Frenzy plus minus tweaks this a bit, where players lose a point for every death. Team Frenzy divides the player into two opposing forces of green and red, so try not to team kill in that one. Frenzy Gold includes gems that float up and down, and will award you a point for their collection. Gold Rush is slightly different. No points for any kills in this one, scoring is based entirely on gem collection, while Fox and Hounds limit the number of players that can score a point via collecting a gem to one. The Fox cannot shoot, and must avoid all the other players who are designated Hounds. When a Hound kills the Fox, they become the new Fox. This is visually depicted with the floor turning green, and an appropriately raucous sound playing every time a weapon button is pressed. Fox and Hound mode is very difficult to play with 8 players in the field, 
This is simply because there's so many people vying to become the fox that you don't last very long before you get blown up. The direct inspiration for this game is presumably Maze Wars, which has had numerous additions made for very early systems. The first was from 1974. A version called Maze Wars Plus was created for the Macintosh in 1987, and there is an iOS version as well. In terms of spiritual successes to Super Maze Wars, I found one beta by a John Haggerty that was last updated in 2004. Here it is. It's interesting to look at if nothing else, as it doesn't play so well. The controls are dodgy, and there isn't any sound. It was only a beta though, so you can't really fault it for that. If you fancy playing Super Maze Wars on a modern system, the Macintosh emulator Basilisk 2 is stated as being compatible, according to the game's page on Macintosh Garden. Sheepshaver might also be an option, but no promises there. As mentioned earlier, it runs on all but the earliest of Macs, so I would, as I always do, recommend playing on original hardware, as Macintosh emulation is notoriously tetchy. One other observation I'd like to make is that back in 1993, this game retailed for £47. Now, I've punched this into an inflation calculator to find that this is £87, or $105, US dollars, in today's money. By modern standards then, this is very costly indeed for a 700 kilobyte computer game. That said, it was distributed without copy protection. It even says so on the front of its box. Presumably this was done to encourage multiple installs, so people could play against one another on their own network. Split the costs between a few people who wanted to play this together, and perhaps this price doesn't sound so silly. All in all, I think Super Maze Wars will continue to be remembered fondly. It's aged rather well, so people returning to this title will likely still have fun. What it doesn't have is longevity. So while it will consistently kill the odd 5 or 10 minutes here and there, I shouldn't think it would be too long before somebody playing on their own gets a bit bored, particularly when you get used to the AI and the Challenger roads. Playing against other humans is definitely the definitive way of playing this game, so should you be so inclined to network some old maps, don't forget your copy of Super Maze Wars. Thanks ever so much for watching.